Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to O Culture, where we celebrate birthdays by interpreting our own natal charts. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here, and boy, are we feeling it right now. Just off of Full Moon and Taurus this past weekend on the heels of Halloween, Samhain, the Day of the Dead, and our annual Trap or Treat series that tackled all of that and then some. If you missed those episodes, well, you really missed a chance to peek behind the curtain and see who I am and what I'm about in a more artistic sort of way. But that theme has carried over to this episode, albeit in a more direct way. And let me tell you why. If you're listening to this on November 7th, it is my birthday. Now, I don't really care about celebrating my birthday. I usually don't. It's just another day for me. So this episode is not some egotistical, self-indulgent crap that I'm throwing out there because I want the attention. In fact, this wasn't even going to be an episode that I shared with all y'all. Now, this started out actually as a casual conversation with our guest tonight, Michael Joseph, the man behind the Schism 206 YouTube channel. Some of you may have heard Mike on the Sage of Quay Radio Hour or the Higher Side Chats podcast. He is quite the resource for occult and esoteric information. He spent a lot of time reading and interpreting texts in this area and showing how the information in these texts comprise an occult belief system of the quote-unquote elite and how those beliefs are portrayed in our cultural and political institutions. Now, Mike and I did have a conversation about all of that, and that'll be online in a few weeks. But the basis of this conversation stems from Mike's blossoming interest in astrology. He wants to start offering astrological services for folks who are interested in having things like their natal chart read, and he asked me if I wouldn't mind being a guinea pig for him. And who am I to turn down a free natal chart reading, am I right? So I actually went into this conversation recording it for my own benefit without the intention of sharing it, but as we got into the reading, I thought that based on the way Mike was explaining the information in my chart that it would also be pretty beneficial to a general audience. There's enough information in here about things like trines and sextiles and conjunctions and rising signs and how Chiron affects the natal chart that I thought, well, why the hell not share it? So the first hour or so of the chat is focused on that. It's a it's an interpretation and a reading of my natal chart. And then the conversation transitions into more of a self-reflection, if you will, where Mike and I really open up about our concerns with occult and conspiracy culture. We may ruffle a few feathers here because I think we touch on a couple areas and make a couple points that I don't think get discussed much. I should also point out that the video version of this on YouTube does contain visual support. Mike was kind enough to record the video of our Skype conversation as part of his own learning process. And he was also kind enough to clean it up a little bit in post-production for me. So if you're watching on YouTube, you've got the best seat in the house for the first hour or so. And then the video reverts back to the normal title screen. If you're on iTunes, Stitcher, or any other podcast app, I've included a link to that YouTube video in the show notes if you're interested. I think it really is the best way to interact with this particular episode. If you're not interested in the video, if you can't get to it, I've also included a link to an image of my natal chart if you just want to glance at it throughout for some context. I should also note that this conversation just sort of starts. There's no formal introduction or greeting, it's just Mike and I chatting. So let's open our minds and get ourselves ready for a nice, long, critical think. And let's cast this pot off deep into the heart of the Zodiac as it stood on November 7th, 1983 at 9.20pm when the sun was in Scorpio, the moon was in Sagittarius, and when my mom finally decided she'd had enough of me kicking and screaming inside of her. Enjoy. And so, yeah, basically what I have here is all of the the major aspects in here uh, mm-hmm. that are the red ones right here. This That's a square. The kind of browner ones is the oppositions. The blue or darker blue is the trine. And then the more teal blue is the sextile. And what I like to do is take it down to like three degrees of, you see how it says three degrees there? Yeah. Um, I, you know a little bit about astrology, but I don't know like how much, but you know like about like the, the orbs and how tight they are and things like that? I've heard the terms, but I don't really know much about those in depth. Okay, no. well, I'll just explain. It's, it's really simple. Basically, okay. all it is is I'll show you the grid here. 
Okay, so these are all the planets and the sensitive points in the chart. And this is an aspect chart. So here, here's Venus. So you have Venus square Neptune. So you just follow that over. And that's mm -hmm. square one degree and 10 minutes. So there are 60 minutes in a degree. It's kind of like, you know, counting time. Mm -hmm. um, so what this means is the closer you get to zero degrees, the more tight the orb is, as people will call it. So a square is essentially 90 degrees. So what it is is you're right here in the middle at your birth. And this uh, square here, one of these red lines, that forms like 90 degrees to where you are at your birth. And so what an orb is, is the closer you are to the exact angle of the aspect, for in this instance, 90 degrees, the more powerful it will be. So what's going on here, um, just to make an easier example, I guess, um, Okay, here's Neptune. You can see it, 27 degrees. And yeah. then over here you have Venus, 28 degrees. So if Neptune was 28 degrees, and that would be like an exact square. So you're really just looking for the degrees matching up to the same number or the closer they are. And then it just depends on the angle relationship to them that makes it harmonious or tense or whatever so in this case it's a tense one um so anything that is three degrees or less is seen as to be a very powerful orb in these major aspects so okay. everything here is pretty powerful so this is what you would look for in the chart like these would be the most influential relationships to each other now you can widen this and I'll take it out to 4.5 degrees. So now all of a sudden you get more added in. Right. Th they're still they're still fairly powerful but not as tight as these ones back at 3 degrees. So if I went all the way to 1 degree, those are your most very tight aspects. And so this uh square relationship that, that, that would be like your greatest source of tension or something like that. And this blue, this trine, that would be like a greater harmony. So that's kind of the theory behind the orbs. And so that's kind of how I look at things uh, to start. But also, if you have two planets next to each other, that merges that energy together, theoretically. So... Okay. Um, well, let me find a conjunction. Okay. So you see this little circle with a little line going out there? Yep. That's the symbol for a conjunction. So out of all of these aspects, the conjunction is the most powerful. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what you look for first in terms of the aspects. So your most powerful conjunction is Neptune and your moon. And that's why I wrote a whole lot about it. Right. And, um, yeah, and then the other thing is, if we go back to your chart, there's these four points on the chart. Let me actually make this a little bit easier to see them. One second. I'm just going to take everything away for one minute. Except for Chiron. You, you wanted to know about that. <laughs> um, so here it says AC and DC. Mm -hmm. That line is the horizon. So if you're standing in the middle, when you look to the east, that's the AC. You would see the C Cancer constellation. If you look to the west, that's the DC. You would see Capricorn. So when you were born, Cancer was on the ascendant. So that's why it's your rising sign. And even if there's no planets there, just that point is seen as very important in evolutionary astrology, especially, which is sort of like it indicates more of your purpose or your path or 
the general direction in which you know your life is intended to go um and the planet that rules this constellation will be important so in this case cancer is ruled by you know no no oh. i don't <laughs> the moon cancer is the moon sign so your neptune moon conjunction is even more powerful because cancer is on your ascendant so the three biggest things in your chart are your ascendant sign and your sun and moon sign the luminaries right. and the ascendant those are like the big three basically right kind of look at it as sort of like this trinity kind of thing i guess so so what are some of the uh what are some of the traits of cancer then that so my understanding is the rising sign is is the that's the that's the personality that you sort of project out into the world yeah and All right. in evolutionary astrology it's more than that that's okay. more like a, a soul purpose or something like that and i'm i'm still like a lot of people will associate it with like reincarnation they'll say oh at one point you came at a different ascendant sign and now you've chosen to do cancer i don't necessarily follow that viewpoint to me that's like speculative if you want to believe that that's fine but like for, i i agree with a general theme of it that there is something intrinsic about that sign to your life as a whole but the reasons why i might differ but the end results pretty much the same in, in a lot of instances so i actually view a lot of astrology through my own lens of understanding like what it is or why i think it it works or is helpful but even though a lot of other astrologers might tell you something very different but in in the end the end result is often a very similar mindset so it's kind of like uh um who did you listen to the higher side chats where, where greg had an astrologer on recently just a couple episodes ago by chance yeah yeah he was the, talking uh, about like the flat earth model versus like the heliocentric model in terms of astrology and he's like i don't give a shit which one it is it doesn't change the end result for me that's kind of how i feel with it with a lot of this stuff where okay. you know i agree with a lot of the same themes but i might differ on the reasons why those things are there so whatever your purpose is indicated like some people will say you choose it for yourself i don't necessarily agree with that or i i, I don't i don't i'm not like married to that idea maybe we do i don't know but um so the, the cancer stuff, the attributes, I think uh, basic themes of cancer, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very intuitive, uh, lives sort of by emotional needs um, or, or just sort of like, um, you know, your, your basic well-being, if your emotional needs are being more satisfied, you're going to feel a lot better. That's kind of the theory of it versus like somebody else, maybe like a Capricorn, you know, they don't maybe necessarily need to feel as emotionally satisfied to go out and do something. And um, it, it's, it's not so much that Capricorn person wouldn't be like, they wouldn't need an emotional need, but it's like not as important. That's kind of what it is. So, um, and there's another relationship of cancer to the mass consciousness or the collective consciousness. So it, it might be like somebody with a more cancer influence might be more tapped into the, the collective, you know, uh, well of water that mm -hmm. everyone's kind of like, you know, subject to in this world that we have. And I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, I'll, I'll, that's so important to a lot of the, you know, the controlling forces here steering the mass consciousness. There's something about a, a collective participation in things that's very important, I think. And so cancer ascendance is said to be a little bit more in tune with that, you know. Um, what do you make of that collective unconscious personally? I think like there's just some of it, I guess. Uh, I think there's something to it for sure. Um, it, and it's kind of like, uh, I guess the way I look at it is this. Um, if I walk into, you know, a concert or something like that, 
the, the collective energy of what's going on at that concert, if, if you're more like, res, you know, in touch with that, it's, it's going to affect you a lot more. Um, and so if I'm not sensing a very good vibe with my general mass environment, um, I'm not going to feel so great about being there, even if it's like something I'd like to. And this is a personal experience because cancer, like I said, it's ruled by the moon. So a lot of this has to do with general moon qualities in a sense. And Neptune is kind of like this other higher dimension of that. Um, so this is why your moon conjunct Neptune is like, it's like doubling down on that energy, but in a more like uh, spiritual way. Neptune is like seen as being more um, otherworldly influence, but that's a current that still runs through like the collective consciousness in like the earthly sense. Um, where other people might be more in tune with just like what's going on in the earthly nature of it, where Neptune influence might be seeing both. If you can see what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess uh, it, it's really just a, a matter of like being surrounded by many people and the collective vibe of all those people molding into one. I think that would be like more cancer like so being more receptive to that and this is why cancer people are said to be um w when things are overwhelming for them emotionally they'll retreat you know like the crab they'll retreat in their shell whatever that might be their their house their room their their car you know whatever you know everybody does that to some extent but that's going to be like way more important for somebody like that versus somebody who's like an aries or something so an aries when they're all like you know uh bummed out they might go fuck some shit up or they might go try to establish their you know go work out go you know whatever where the cancer person is like i don't want to be anywhere just but here in my own little room and you know that kind of thing so <clears throat> yeah I, I would say that's <laughs> that's probably how i handle those situations for sure so is the is the rising sign the ascendant is that so we said that that was what you project outwardly uh into the world so to speak is is that then really is that more important than the sun sign uh it kind of depends um so it's also kind of like how people might see you so everything i describe somebody might look at you or the, their general first impression upon meeting you would would be similar to the cancer attributes and so, like, for example, I'm a Capricorn rising. I'm also a Capricorn sun. So oh. it's kind of both there. But Capricorns are supposed to be a little bit more uh, matter of fact, uh, a little more serious, and kind of like a, a little bit like intense and uh saturnian so they might seem a little bit depressing or something like that or a little bit like you know it's not going to be like this flamboyant whatever energy so you know when people look at me supposedly that should be part of it but i also have things in my first house which is tied to your ascendant so i have venus and mercury so i should probably be very talkative when i meet people or more pleasant because venus so it, it i i I, I think that's good, like having the Venus to counteract the Saturn makes you a little bit more pleasant, whereas somebody who's just purely Saturn might be like, dude, that guy's a fucking downer. I don't want to like hang out with, you know, and it all depends. Like th there, there's positive things to Saturn and negative things. So when you're expressing the positive things, people might, you know, if somebody's looking to somebody who's like more grounded down to earth and might have a lot of like more wisdom or whatever they might want those saturnian qualities in the positive sense but if somebody is saturnian and is depressed like they're not going to be able to hide it very well um mm -hmm. they're just going to seem like really kind of like morose and stuff like that whereas the cancer type person they might just feel that immediately from people stuff like that so it's a lot of dynamics of like more intuitive emotional sensitivity versus like a practicality of like analyzing a physical appearance like somebody might see that somebody's upset in a capricornian mindset 
because they can see it in a physical way in their face. You know, they're sad or whatever. Or the cancer yeah. person might just feel it in the tone of their voice and stuff like that. So I think it's interesting how a lot of different signs and elements, they, they, they kind of, I think, like, are all interacting with the same themes but in different ways, and that's what makes it more unique. I don't know if yeah. that answered your question. <laughs> no, no, it, it does because especially recently um, – just in the past few weeks of my life, man, I've, I've been, I think I've taken that. I call it more of like an energetic sensitivity. I, I I've taken that or maybe not me personally has taken it, but that seems to have ramped itself up in the past. You know, like I said, a few weeks of my life, just, mm-hmm. I know we had the eclipse recently, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it just seems that I'm, I'm getting just bombarded on all fronts by, by both positive and negative things. Like I'm feeling the positive energies a lot more, but I'm also feeling those negative energies a lot more too. So that's, that can be pretty frustrating. Yeah. And, um, the other thing that's interesting is, so the sign that your moon is in is important. It's going to be related to a lot of this because again, the, the signs is sort of like, I guess a filter in a way. So whatever lunar energies, if you want to call it that, are coming through, they're going to be filtered through a more Sagittarian way. And right. Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter. And the reason Jupiter is also important in your chart is because there's something called a final dispositor. And basically, it's, it's, it works like this. So if you have your sun here, see the little sun glyph I'm pointing to? Yep. Uh, that's in Scorpio. So Scorpio, if we use traditional rulers, is ruled by Mars. So what you want to do is you want to make a chain back to the last planet, and that's what you know is sort of at the root of things. So uh, your sun is in a Mars sign, so we got to find Mars. So Mars is over here. Mars is in Virgo, so that's a Mercury sign. So now we got to find Mercury. Well, Mercury is back in Scorpio, so that's in a Mars sign. So basically... Mercury and Mars are kind of sharing the root of that in a way. Whereas your sun will kind of be, it won't be at the core of these issues as much as Mercury and uh, Mars will because they're the ones that are like the final spot you can find. Now the reason why Jupiter is important is because it's in its own sign. So if it's in its own sign, it's just answering to itself that's kind of the idea so it's kind of like it's the ruler it's the owner of all of the shit going through Sagittarius and so this is why your moon being in Sagittarius it's going to like answer to the themes of Jupiter so Jupiter is about being expansive uh, it, it's, it's seen as more fortunate you know being more optimistic you know jove jovial and then Sagittarius is about also expansion and, and a lot of more like idealistic ideas and philosophies rather than the practical implementation. So you might be like, you know, that's why it's like lawmakers are associated with Sagittarius or the house of Sagittarius, which is the ninth house. It's like mm-hmm. lawmakers make laws. They, they draft them up. They figure out these ideas of which to live by. But Saturn is like the enforcer of those laws. That would be like the police system or something. And that's why Saturn is the, uh, excuse me, Capricorn, ruled by Saturn, is the sign after Sagittarius. So in theory, there's like a progression. And so Aries is like bursting onto the scene. That's why you see like Jesus with the little lamb. That's supposed to be the lamb of God in the astro theology of Christianity. And then from there, you go through the zodiac. And then like each sign has like sort of an interesting relationship to the sign that's preceded it or after it. And some might be a little conflicting where it's like cancer, the next sign is Leo. So let's say you had an ascendant at 29 degrees cancer. This is almost into the next sign. Some mm-hmm. people will say that indicates a critical spot where you're going to have a little bit of a struggle because you're going to want to feel like you're moving into that next sign, but you're still going to feel kind of back in your own. And so cancer is more like you know emotional, it's intuitive, it's nurturing other people, other people's needs. Um you know, you might feel like when 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 people sh- when sh- shit goes down in people's lives, they might come to you for emotional support. That's kind of like the idea behind cancer. 
Um, yeah, that's that's very accurate, by the way. Okay. Yeah, and um, and especially with Neptune and and your Moon conjunct, it's going to be a lot more intense. But let's just say you had it almost going into Leo, where Leo is you're trying to assert your own self-expression, your own ego, and who you are, self-realization. That's why it's ruled by the sun, right? The ego. This is me. Um, you know, hear me roar, right? Mm -hmm. So if you had your ascendant at the end of the, the, um, the sign here, then in theory – you might have some struggles with wanting to be more assertive, but that might have struggles with the cancer. So this is sort of like the idea of kind of building different parts of yourself and when to utilize them. And that's kind of the, the, the difference between the squares and the trines where trines, things might com come more naturally to you to be like something versus the square. You, you're going to be at odds with something, but the theory is, at least in more modern astrology, is that you can reconcile that, but you got to put in some fucking work to figure it out. And you have to make sacrifices where the square, like what they say about it is like it's two things trying to butt or get in the way of each other. You can't fit both of them. Um, so you have to sort of like, OK, um, I, let's just say you're a domineering person. It's all about me. And you want to try to allow for more of other people's opinions. You have to be mindful of it. it. It takes work because you're not naturally inclined to do that. Like me right now, I'm fucking talking all over the place and I'm not letting you talk at all. So I'm kind of like in that mindset. But I'm like, OK, wait a second. Let me chill out and, you know, see what Ryan has to say. So go ahead. <laughs> OK, so, you know, you were talking about how if I was – further down on a degree path, like closer to Leo, I, I might be struggling, but my, my ascendant is firmly in cancer. So yeah, right in the middle. What, what sort of struggles or have we already outlined that with just the sort of sensitivities? Is that the same sort of struggles that, that we're talking about if it's firmly there? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean struggles. It can be uh, talent. You know what I mean? Like th that can be, yeah. that's something people need. They need somebody who's going to be able to listen to their emotional shit and not be a dick about it or be like, dude, stop being so emotional. Fuck off. You know what I mean? Like that that's more like like Aries or something or, or Capricorn or, or maybe even Virgo in, in some sense. So and this is in harmony with your son. So let me actually just make it more simple here. Well, I was just going to say while you're doing that. Yep. So that can obviously be a positive characteristic, you know, like, and I have noticed myself doing that more recently, like shutting down that emotional sort of talk with people because I, my, because like I said, I'm, I'm getting bombarded with all of these different energies and I, I just have to block some of it out. But then I've also struggled in the past with asserting my own emotions probably a little too much if that makes sense. So is that part of this this answer struggle that we're talking about? Well, part of your the, the struggle for it right now, I think Saturn is right near your moon. Let me double check. Yeah. So Saturn, this is, I put it on a transit chart here. All the shit on the outside of this wheel, that's where things are right now. Uh, let me just... I'm just going to say Cincinnati, close enough. Um, okay. So right now, Saturn is 21 degrees Sagittarius, and Saturn moves pretty slow. And it's encroaching on your moon. So Saturn, again, is about more um, structure, discipline, uh, being, I guess, more logical or more practical doesn't really have time for people's emotional bullshit. That's kind of the energy of it. So it is starting to move towards your moon and your Neptune. And so that doesn't mean that you have to be more like that, but that might be part of this influence that, okay, now it might be time to pursue things more seriously. Uh, Saturn is also about 
like hard work in the sense of like doing things when you don't feel like doing them. Let's say, okay, I want to be a, I, I want to be a boxer. I only say that because I've been taking boxing classes recently. Okay, <laughs> now wait, I, I want to be a pro wrestler then. Go okay, ahead. pro wrestler. And and it might be like Sagittarius might have a lot of grand like ideals and visions about being a pro te- pro le- pro wrestler. You know, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to implement myself in society. It's your philosophical and, like, expansive mindset on it. Saturn is actually fucking doing it. That's kind of what Saturn represents. Okay. And so uh, if Saturn is moving towards these things, then that means it would be a good time to start disciplining yourself, putting your, your time into some of these things and it might demand a sacrifice on emotional relationships with other people it doesn't mean that you get rid of them completely but you might have to be like dude you know i i i i gotta i gotta work on some things here you know i want to help you out but or it might be saturn is also about being more like it's what's real and this is the point of a saturn return it, it, mm-hmm. When you're 28, 29, Saturn has come back through 360 degrees of the zodiac. So Saturn is kind of like this reaping and sowing thing. So if you've been more honest about shit uh, and, and pursued things in a more like, you know, truthful way, that the, the theory is you should get more benefits. And if you've been like slacking off and, and, and not been very serious about stuff and just kind of coasting through life, then Saturn might hit you pretty hard when you're 28. Um, but that's an opportunity to, to be like, okay, now I'm confined because I, I, I spent all this time traveling the world in extravagance, but I have no fucking money and I might have to get a shit job and I feel confined. That That's sort of like a Saturn, might, people might like look at it in a bad way. So Saturn is about teaching discipline, things like that. So as this comes more closer, um, that that theme might start popping up more you might feel like god i gotta i gotta get my shit together or something like that and it it might be like okay i have an emotional need to do something these this cancer theme will still be there but what can i do about that that is a practical implementation how can i create a structure how can i put that into the physical world and feel happy about it like what i'm doing has an emotional need I'm I'm doing something that makes me feel good, but I'm also creating some sort of enterprise, business, physical reality. And also Saturn is associated with this 10th house here. That's the house of the career. So you might have more of a, or or not necessarily career, but just your public face of, I want to be known for something. I want to, you know, I want to be out in public. I want to do something. I want to go up this ladder of, but you're choosing the latter based on an emotional need. And so Saturn, if you want to benefit off of this, this would be the time to, okay, now I got to be disciplined, learn shit, do things correctly, build the structure up, right? That's like a beneficial way of looking at it where somebody else who won't utilize that energy correctly will just be bummed out that they might feel more confined and they might just get super depressed and emotionally depressed and just retreat and just, sit inside and play video games the rest of their life you know what i mean like it's all about how you want to pursue and utilize these energies versus like succumbing to them in a way that's just gonna fuck you over you know you in in a in a way that um i i guess uh that's the saturnian lead you'll just be stuck and sinking okay so you mentioned um, trines earlier, mm-hmm. and I have heard that term. I've read a little bit about it, but in terms of the importance of them in the chart, how important are they, and which one of, of the trines that I have on mine is the most significant or the one that I should really pay the most attention to? Okay. Um, I'd say that right here, You have your ascendant and again the ascendant that's not like the most important thing is the planet that rules it because the planets have the power 
the ascendant is just a point. There's no planetary energy there. So that's why the ruler of it is important. Now, if you had a planet that was placed here, that's going to become super important. Like for me, I have my sun conjunct my ascendant. So that means my sun is very important in all the ascendant matters. But it's just a point where like energy can manifest. And so if there's anything aspecting it, then that makes it important. Otherwise, you just revert to the moon because that rules that point. So, for example, here you have your sun and your Mercury both trying the ascendant. So what that means is, and that, that, this is, I would say, something that's, I don't like using the word good or favorable or bad and unfortunate. But this is something that is going to make things a lot easier because your sun, that's like your solar force, you know, you, y your ego, your, your basic, like, consciousness, right? That is going to be in harmony with your moon because, again, your moon rules this. And your sun isn't aspecting the moon in any way that's very pertinent. It's in a different sign that's it's a different element, but there's no aspect that's tense or anything like that. So generally speaking, your sun and moon nature will be harmonious. So this means that your, your conscious and your subconscious will be pretty harmonious. You know, you... you uh, you'll probably your your emotional nature and your like logical nature probably won't have a lot of conflict. It's just going to depend on like things transiting and stuff like that. But in your general everyday life, if there's no other things going on, that's going to be good for you. And uh, so and also Mercury is about logic, communication, your 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 way of thinking about things, your way of analyzing things, stuff like that. That's also in harmony with this. So you're probably going to be pretty decent at like analyzing your emotional nature or, or, or looking at it. And also it's in the sign of Scorpio and Scorpio is the natural, um, you know, self analyzing, searching the depths of your self sign. So a lot of that self introspection is probably going to be pretty harmonious with your intuitive emotional nature so is there any uh negative aspect to that that trine then you could be lazy about it that's the that's the point about trines it's like yeah. it's just a natural gift whereas a sextile well, i'll show you one real quick okay. i won't i won't explain it but just so you can see so here's the sextiles the sextiles makes a 60 degree angle to yourself Whereas the trine makes a 120 degree angle. Now the trine is something that just happens naturally. The sextile is seen as more as like a harmonious opportunity. If you kind of put some work in, it should come a lot more fluidly for you to do something with that relationship. Whereas the trine is just sort of generally part of you of something that just, and what I mean by comes easy, it's more like you're just in harmony with it. Where it's like, let's just say that somebody is in harmony with something financial in the chart and like like they're the, the house of possessions or something. They might just be naturally better at handling finances based on a trine. That doesn't mean that finances just come to them. It just means they're naturally going to make more smart decisions about it versus somebody who's a square. They might just make more dumb decisions about it naturally. You know what I mean? They might be like, oh... Like they might get caught up in like get rich quick thing. You know what I mean? It's, just, it's not necessarily that things just come to you because, you know, it's just things just come to you. It's just it's a mode in your brain that you'll naturally avoid stupid decisions or you'll naturally think about things, both sides of things versus somebody might have a more dualistic consciousness where they can't separate their emotions from their conscious thought. Um that's kind of the, the idea about it. And so what you said before about anything negative with it, it mm -hmm. might be something you can rely on. Things that come easy, you might just kind of revert back to them. Um, so let's just say there was a trine that indicated, like, I don't know, let's just say musical talent. Let's say you just, like we were talking about before, the singer. Maybe you just naturally have a good voice. And you just try to get by on that. 
and instead of actually putting work into it, some Saturnian quality, you just kind of coast on your talent. And maybe as you get older, your health gets a little worse and your voice just starts to, you can't maintain it as well. Then that natural talent, you might be able to go out and sound good for 20 minutes, but then you'll, you'll tank. But if you would put in some work to really refine it and be more efficient, you're going to be like a fucking singing God versus somebody else who's like been struggling with it. And they, you know what I mean? So it's almost like anything can be used in a positive or negative sense. Just certain things might require a lot more work and like nitty gritty, like going through some shit to get there, you know? Right. So in terms of the sextile, then I know you said you weren't going to explain it, but I would like you to, if you don't mind, just briefly. Oh, yeah. No, I, I did. I didn't want to explain it then to go off on a tangent, but, um, Let's see here. Okay, you have a sextile between Mercury, that little guy there in the yellow, yeah. and Mars, that little guy in the red. So what that indicates is you might be uh, pretty good at speaking passionately about things. You might be able to communicate your emotional or your uh, your your um, self-expression Mars Mars and the Sun are more like masculine like self-expression this is me this is what I want to do you might be able to talk about your personal desires pretty easily with people um, and, and have that come across clearly logically you know stuff like that um, or, or it's a sextile maybe you might be able to put those things into action more easily um, but you have to the, the sex style indicates you, you have to like do something about it but if you do it might come more naturally to you you might find more success to, to be able to have a, a drive towards something and without a whole lot of obstacles coming in unless something else is aspecting Mars which you do have some squares going to Mars so that's where it can get complicated but in terms of talking about it and, and thinking about it and analyzing it that should be, you know, more uh, easily accessible. So what does the square do then? Like, how does that complicate what you just said? Let me bring it back. So the square indicates, I guess it's just like this tension that is sort of, um, I think the way to describe it, which makes sense to me, some of the square might be part of your own issues, your own shit. Some might be part of somebody else's. And and somebody, some might be part of just like physical circumstances, whereas something like an opposition, which is the other tense aspect, that seemed mm -hmm. to be more of a projection. You might project something and it's what you might attract. So it's like, you know, let's just say I'm always complaining about I never get in good relationships. The girls always, you know, cheat on me. What the fuck? Well, maybe you're picking like more shallow women, but you're blinded by something else. And that's just the natural course that somebody's you, you might see them as something that they're not. And, you know, they're they're one of these people that, like they're just going to bounce around and, and not really want to be confined where you projected in your mind like oh this is the kind of girl that would want to settle down with me but you were blinded by all these things so you're projecting things and you're getting things back that's kind of the opposition where the square is there's a lot more factors that can be involved the opposition is two right it's two points like mm -hmm. opposite each other where the square is two points kind of squaring off and it's kind of like more angular there's more angles involved versus just a one, two, like A, B, nothing, not as much to it. And so this is why like the squares can be a little bit more complex, they say. And um, so essentially here, this square is your moon and your Mars are in a square. So this means that you might have a more of a difficulty, some sort of tension, uh, implementing those emotional needs or asserting yourself in the way that 
you might uh, really want to. And since Neptune is attached to it, Neptune is about like a lot of like self-sacrifice and stuff like that. So maybe you self-sacrifice your own egoic needs or your self-expression needs for other things. It's one of those things where there's a lot of themes that are involved. It, the, the idea is that the themes will be there, but the way they all integrate will be very unique. And so that's sort of a part of this idea of like, okay, you might be able to talk about your will and your desire with other people, things you want to do, things you want to like work on. And, and your, your uh, Mars is in Virgo and Virgo is about like practicality, analyzation, kind of duty, service, developing a skill or a craft. So that's something you might talk about a lot. Oh, yeah, I'm all excited to like get really good at wrestling and do all these things and blah, 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 blah. But since it's squared to your moon and Neptune conjunction, you might have to self-sacrifice yourself for somebody that might get in the way of that. You might sacrifice your emotional needs for other people. You might have just some emotional. The other thing is Neptune is about escapism and it, it's more in the, the mystical realm. So you might just kind of escape with other things. So let's say uh, you were you OK. I want instead of. Uh, OK, here's a perfect example. You could talk all about wrestling and I want to be good at it. And I want to do all these things. But since this is squared your moon and Neptune and escapism, you might actually just get really good at net, uh, wrestling video games instead of actually going out physically doing wrestling. Because if you're escaping this reality for a false reality, but you're still putting your drive and ambition and your mental abilities into it. So you might be like, and Mercury's about kind of dexterity too. So you're, you're, you you might have a good like hand-eye coordination or something like that. Um and or but again since neptune and moon are there you might use it in a, a escapism delusional way and you might be really good at wrestling video games that's that's a perfect example of how that might implement in a more negative way dude i am awesome at wrestling video games how did you know that? <laughs> so oh, man. so so yeah so this is kind of like the theory behind all of these things where really with astrology you got to talk with people about this stuff. You can't just say that this is how you're going to be because there's so many other factors. But the point being is it helps you identify shit that you can be conscious of and be like, okay, this is a tension. I want to escape from a lot of these things, but I know that if I'm conscious of it and I don't do it and I try to bring that Neptunian mystical part down to something in reality, that's going to help alleviate this tension versus I can stay in my alternate fantasy land and it might be satisfying emotionally for me, but it's not going to have a lot of practical help for my physical existence. Right. Okay. So I have three more questions about this, just minor things. Sure. My first one, I see, you know, all my planets, sort of clustered down at the bottom of this chart, bottom right-ish. Is that common? Are people's planets usually clustered like that? Or does this mean something that it, I should be aware of? It does happen. Um, it's called a stellium. If you have four planets in one sign or in one house, so the house is, uh, if you look at the mouse cursor, um, mm. the, the, here, see it says number five, that's the fifth house. Yeah. So you have Saturn, Sun, Mercury, and Uranus all in the fifth house. So that's a house stellium. But you also have Pluto, Saturn, Sun, Mercury all in Scorpio. So that's a sign stellium. And what that means is, as far as I understand it, there's just a lot of energy associated with those signs. So themes of Scorpio and Sagittarius... If you read up a lot about those, you're probably going to find that they ring true a lot. Um, well, wait, wait. Isn't Jupiter in the fifth house too there? Uh, no, it's it's. there's a little I, line that goes to the sixth okay. house. Okay. Now, right. here's the – the houses are tough because there's a lot of different systems. If you look at up here, it says houses. Look at all these different house systems. 
Oh, wow. Okay. And so you can click on a different house system. Like, let's say I do Porphyrius here. Now, all of a sudden, things shifted a little bit. I'll yeah. go back to Placidus. Now, for you, luckily, because it makes things less confusing, it really doesn't change anything in your chart. Whereas my chart, it changes a butt ton of stuff if I use different house systems. So the houses, I look at them this way. The, the, the placements that you can find that stay whenever you change them, I, I kind of put more stock into it. Whereas something does change a lot, I, I just would ask the person, well, what makes more sense to you? Do you have more fifth house or sixth house themes if something is kind of on the edge? Now, some people use something called the uh, equal house, or excuse me, whole sign system. Now, if you look, that changes everything big time. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have never identified with this system. Some people swear by it. And this, this is what really makes me think of a lot of this stuff could be just a lot more psychological than actual real, like, uh, you know, this placement in the stars exudes this influence for sure because a lot of people will identify with these other systems that are completely different and so and vedic astrology is a lot different too so mm -hmm. i i kind of am in the middle ground where i think that there's something to some sort of strange planetary cycles influence but i do think there's a lot of psychology that people just sort of assimilate like you know if you look at a tarot card the imagery there is going to mean something different to everyone else. And then if you tell somebody what the image is supposed to represent, that's going to still spark different thoughts in anybody else and how they react to it. So really it's a, like a Rorschach test kind of thing. So this is the way I view astrology. I think it's a bit of both. Now, to the, the percentage that it's one or the other, I don't really know. I kind of vary on it. But back to your stellium question. Yeah. That's the general idea of it. So – the house system, I don't really put as much stock into except for your your chart angles I talked about, the AC and the DC, and then there's the IC and the MC. Those are the, the points that are really unique to the birth, um, and those start the first, fourth, seventh, and tenth houses. Those are called the angular houses. You'll hear that from people. In almost every house system, those are always – those start those houses no matter what. There's only a couple houseisms that don't do that. So those are things that I feel like you can probably bank on a little bit more as having more profundity. But in terms of the stellium, the other thing that people will say is that you might have an overabundance of consciousness or energy or, or tendencies in these signs. And that can be a cool thing. You know, like Scorpio, you can be really good at digging into things, looking. Scorpio is really the sign of the occult. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's about looking into the hidden, deep, secretive nature of things. And it's not pretty. Scorpio is like a death and rebirth sign. You go through some turmoil, some shit, and you come out a much different person. And everybody goes through that to some extent, but Scorpios, it might be like really heavy. And when they go through like a, a intense transformation, like people might be like, holy shit, that person's way different than they were before. And it might be very noticeable to people. They might mm -hmm. be very self-destructive too. And I, I, I have a certain amount of Scorpio influence, but, um, so what some people say is if there's too much shit there and you're just like overwhelmed by some of these themes, they say you could actually look to the opposite end of the Zodiac and try to implement more practicalities with that because that's the polarity. And so there, there's an intrinsic relationship between the opposites there. And so some people might say, well, if you have a lot of shit in Sagittarius, look to more Gemini stuff. Right. Same thing with Scorpio, look to more Taurus stuff. That's just the a, a theory that I've heard people talk about. I haven't really like tried to apply it to people's situations, but again, I haven't like done a lot of this sort of astrological counseling with people. I'm kind of starting this out, you know. Right, right. And I think you're doing a great job by the way. So, my my last two questions can be just combined into one. 
uh, my Chiron and my true node are both in Gemini. What does that mean? Okay. The nodes, let me, uh, sorry, this is probably simplifying it more for myself than you, but I think it will probably be helpful. I just like taking all the other shit out just to mm -hmm. kind of get a clearer picture. Okay. So you, you have your south node here in Sagittarius, mm -hmm. and your north node is here in Gemini. Now, here's another thing where the how this is actually, I was looking at Nathan Lee's chart, and this is what's interesting. Just a quick little side note to, to, to touch upon the house problem I talked about. You can yeah. see here on the mouse cursor, it says mean nodes and true nodes. Yeah. I've read up a bit about this. Apparently, people say mean nodes tend to be more true which is ironic i don't know <laughs> it's so different but if i click on true nodes your 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 nose might change a degree yeah it okay. goes to 16. Okay. now it's 16 degrees and eight minutes so let me change back to mean node so it's 17 degrees 22 minutes so it's a little over a degree change now what's interesting is that can change if your your node is on a, a cusp of a sign, it might put your node in a completely different sign. Yeah. But more importantly, with Nathan Lee's chart, it puts it in a different house. And people say that with the nodes, the house is more important because the nodes travel kind of slowly. Whereas like everybody, I think it's every nine years, they no, excuse me. Every 18 years, the nodes go 180 degrees through, or excuse me, 360 degrees through the zodiac. So, y people born around your time, within give or take a year, you're all going to have your nodes in Cancer and Sagittarius, or excuse me, Gemini and Sagittarius. My nodes, because I was born a couple of years before you, are in Cancer and uh, Capricorn. And the nodes move backwards through the zodiac. Everything else pretty much moves forward unless it's in retrograde, but the nodes move backwards. And okay. so th the nodes supposedly are more like karmic or life path purpose thing. I, I kind of relate it to the ascendant. There's certain things that are seen to be more soul purpose, soul transformation, soul evolution, where you're trying to go to that would be in harmony or in line with you know god the divine purpose whatever the fuck you want to call it the mystical realm um so this is why when i'm going to do things i want to offer like a, a evolutionary purpose package where i might just focus on those sensitive parts so your ascendant your nodes and to some extent i think your midheaven uh, all sort of have to do with this. And, and a lot of people will associate Pluto as part of this evolutionary astrology. So those are like the big, you know, if, you, if you're having like a crisis of like where you're going, your direction in life, supposedly those would be things you might want to examine on. Um, mm -hmm. So anyways, North Node and, um, excuse me, North Node and Gemini. Gemini is more about like being, uh, it, it, it's ruled by Mercury. So you'd want to look to Mercury in your chart, which we talked a little bit about earlier, as part of that. So I guess you doing podcasting might fit this bill because it's about communication, you know, talking, your voice, and that's in harmony with your ascendant, right? So your moon, your emotional needs. And if Neptune, which is like a higher purpose, the more mystical realm is attached to that then that all fits and also not to mention your mercury is in scorpio the sign of the occult so here you are talking about mystical more spiritual things more occult stuff and you're probably having an emotional need served by that you know it probably makes you feel good to talk about these things mm -hmm. and you're talking about them and your north node is there in that sense of purpose um, so it's pretty interesting how that theme kind of already fits, you know, um, and it's also in the 12th house. Now that's interesting too, because the 12th house is essentially very Neptunian. 
that's the final house that's where like that's the, that's another hidden house the hidden houses of the zodiac are the 12th and the 8th houses and to some extent the 4th but those are also associated with the watery signs the 4th house is more associated with cancer themes the 8th house is more associated with scorpio themes and the 12th house is more associated with pisces themes now the other th- interesting thing is your midheaven because i talked about the midheaven i'm circling it right now mm-hmm. that um the midheaven is your public face to the world your social status and, and more what you're striving to be okay if i want to be popular if i want to be a public figure you look to your midheaven as to what that natural desire might be or that potential might be and so it's in pisces and again the midheaven it's like the it, mc is like the ascendant it's just a point on the chart that indicates something, but the planets have the power. So what is the ruler of Pisces? Well, traditionally it's Jupiter, but uh, modernly it's Neptune. And I, I, I like to incorporate both. To me, the traditional ruler is more of like, I think more of a personal association. And the modern ruler, the outer planet, if, if an outer, outer planet does rule a sign... That would be more in line with what we're talking about, a more need to put yourself out to the, the collective to impact a generation because Neptune is a generational planet. It moves very slowly. So the other thing is, if this is in Neptune, then 2012, despite all of the New Age hype around it, was actually probably pretty important for you in terms of like being more aware about a lot of this stuff. Because Neptune moved into its own sign of Pisces. So what that does is it engages all of the energies of Neptune. It kind of doubles down on them. So people where Neptune is in their chart, it's going to start coming through more. And as it moves closer towards Pisces, it's going to become more and more, you know, you're going to be more and more attuned to it. And this is something that definitely happened to me. And I didn't know about any of this until I started looking at the astrology. And I was just like, I wasn't really as much into a lot of, like, spiritual shit like thinking about things from that perspective i kind of like more subconsciously did that but then i started to become more aware of that kind of idea about things right around that time and i thought it was really weird i'm like dude like it's weird how like people say there was something about 2012 about being this sort of like spiritual mystical thing and me being a capricorn i was kind of like well this is probably a bunch of dumb shit (laughs) <laughs> but I had to admit that, man, there was something really weird about how that transferred a lot of things in my life. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, like I said, these things are all connected to each other. Um, and so the 12th house, a lot of Neptunian affairs will have to do with your North Node and what your the North Node is kind of what you're striving to achieve or what you should strive to achieve to feel like you're fulfilling a purpose in this world. Okay. And then uh, just can you touch on the Chiron before we wrap it up here? Because um, that's something that's new to me. And I was just curious about what it meant and, you know, yep. how it, the, being in Gemini may what I have to look out for and what I can uh, what sort of positive traits I can take from that. OK, I'm putting these back. Um. Oh, hold on. Let me bring in a different aspect. This is a lesser aspect, but here, here's the thing about the lesser aspects. This in conjunct here I'm clicking, it will bring yeah. up a little purple line. So that's going okay. to your Chiron. So what this is is uh, – so here's the aspect chart again. Remember I said like three degrees or less is pretty powerful for the major aspects. For the minor yeah. aspects, they can still be powerful, but they got to be a lot tighter so here, what what I do is in my preferences, I have the orb I want to set to anything here. So for example, the conjunction, since it's the most powerful, I can set a wider orb. So it can be a little bit further away, but since it's such a powerful aspect, that's okay. That's the theory behind it. And these smaller mini aspects, you want to set a tighter orb in order to see their influence. If If I tried to set like you know, five degrees away from the being one of those things that just wouldn't even make any sense because it's a minor aspect that needs a lot more tight of an angle. And so when I apply that to your chart, you have a couple of these 
in relationship to your your node and your Chiron actually um, this one's zero degrees so that one's really powerful um, and then Pluto and Chiron and your ascendant and the south node so basically well, sorry let me get back to the chart um, you have a couple things flowing into Chiron here only a couple but you have your Venus and your Venus and your Mars are actually probably going to be pretty powerful because they're right here on this IC. They're conjunct this IC. And again, AC, MC, IC, DC, those are all sensitive points of the chart that have they make things have more of an impact. And part of the reason is, see the IC is 26 degrees and then your MC is 26 degrees. That's a polarity. They're opposites. Yeah. The reason why a planet near there is important is because now it's going to act. It's going to aspect the opposite point as well. So they're conjunct or next to the IC right here, but they're also opposite your midheaven. Yeah. Um. Hold on. I didn't. Oh yeah. There we go. There's the opposition. Yeah. So now that brings them in there. They're both opposite. So that kind of, like I said, doubles down on two sensitive points. So these themes are going to have a lot to do with your IC, which is more your inner personal nature, your your inner life, your home life, your shell. Being a cancer, that might be a little bit more uh, defined. And then on the opposite side, that's the opposite. What's the opposite of your inner world, your public world, right? And so your... Um, your, your ascendant, like I said, your ascendant has similar themes to your, your nodes, if you want to look at it from an evolutionary astrology perspective, has a very tight conconx aspect. That's, it's kind of hard. That's not really like seen as very tense or harmonious. I think it's kind of a mixture of both. It's seen as more of like a, a karmic necessity. So it's interesting that you have a lot of your karmic points, your purpose points are, are connected to each other. And so Chiron is sort of intermingling with this in a way where we have Pluto down here, zero degrees Scorpio. That is in an aspect there. Um, so one, one second, let me clear some clutter here. Okay. Um, Um, uh, try this. Okay, there we go. Oh, wait. Pluto. There. Okay. So what's going on here? Chiron, as far as I understand it, I've done a bit of reading about it. The problem is I, I haven't implemented it a lot into charts. I've seen it in my charts, and it seems to make sense for certain things some things not so much like Chiron for me this is my chart I have Chiron right here in the third house that's a house of like kind of Gemini themes communication logic your your uh, thinking capacity stuff like that and my deepest wound in my life I wouldn't say really has anything to do with that it actually has more to do with my mother um, and the fourth house is more about your mother. So here's the weird thing about the houses. If I change to this equal house system, that puts Chiron in the fourth house. Oh, wow. Yeah. But the problem is that doesn't make sense for the rest of my houses. It changes everything big time. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for me. So this is how it's weird, like, well, you can find stuff that works, and once you change the house system, it might work for one placement, but then the next one's going to be fucked up. So I try not to put, like, I try not to get overly invested in some of this stuff. Your, your Chiron is, uh, okay, let me explain Chiron, sorry. It, it's called, like, the wounded healer, and this, to me, can represent a few different things. Chiron is kind of associated with, like, the Christ archetype. It, um... In mythology, 
Chiron sacrificed himself for Prometheus. So Prometheus was bound because that evil demiurge god was mad at him for enlightening mankind, so he's bound to the physical world. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how much I agree with this Prometheus thing because the elite seem to view themselves as Prometheus, but that's a whole other topic. But you could look at it in your own way. But basically, Chiron is a centaur that sacrificed himself for Prometheus and liberated him and kind of took his place. Um, so it's, it's like this idea of Christ sacrificing himself for humanity, right? This higher spiritual purpose of a sacrifice. So Chiron in many ways is connected to Neptune. Um, just like that Christ sacrifice thing. And like I said, Neptune rules Pisces. And so this is the whole idea about, you know, Jesus Christ and astrotheology. theology. If you take that perspective is more associated with the age of Pisces or Piscean themes, right? Jesus fish, all that shit. So <laughs> there's certain, there's certain things that they are more profoundly connected to each other. So Chiron to me is very profoundly connected to Neptune. Whereas something like the sun is very connect, connected to Mars. That's the male or yang active force. So th- this is kind of like where you want to figure out, okay, these things have common themes, but there's certain, uh, certain differences between Chiron and Neptune that might have more nuances or details. And give me one second. I got to hydrate for a second. <laughs> okay. My problem is when I talk about this stuff, I get really intense about it, and my voice is like, (laughs) it gets dried out quickly. Well, Um, I can tell you're very passionate about it, man. Yeah, I I, I listen to myself on the Sage of Quay interview. I'm like, dude, I sound angry. I don't want to sound angry, Uh, but I don't know. I can't help it, and that's that's a whole other thing that comes back to like a lot of astrology stuff, which is weird. But, um, anyway, so Chiron, that's got this sacrificial part to it. And it's also, in, in a sense, like Christ as a mediator of the divine realm to the earthly realm of man and God, that kind of thing. And that is what Christ is in both Orthodox theology and occult theology. And so um, this is why Chiron is the bridge to the inner and outer planets. So the orbit of Chiron is between Uranus and Saturn. And so if Saturn is the last planet of the material realm it's like the lord of you know the physical reality um uranus is the outer realm which is more spiritual so i I guess there's an astronomical theory behind this where uranus neptune and pluto uh you can't see those with your naked eye except for sometimes you can see uranus i think when it's like it's it's either in leo or opposite leo apparently there's like some situations where you can see it but for the most part, that's the kind of the theory behind it. Oh, we can't see it with our five senses, our naked eye, our Saturnian five senses, physical reality. So therefore, the influence is more metaphysical. Whereas Saturn, we can see. And so Chiron mediates between the two. And that's why it has this Christ archetype to it. It sacrifices itself to come down for humanity to mediate the divine knowledge and they call it the rainbow bridge. So this is why it's interesting. There's an occult theme to the rainbow. And uh, I don't know if you ever played like fucking Mario Kart was like rainbow bridge and shit like that. There's all this weird occult shit built in the video games. It's kind of insane. I used to play tons of video games, so I'm a little bit too well versed in that. <laughs> really? That's something we could talk about then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. I used to be addicted big time and that's why I traded playing music instead which sucked because it was a lot harder and that was my saturnian squares coming out where okay i gotta fucking put in the hard work and do something that i want to do but actually do something in reality not in some fake reality so that was my own issues with that theme but um anyways back to this chiron like i said it's the it's called the rainbow bridge and there's this book by this woman barbara hanclough if you actually want to read more on it um, okay. It's pretty decent. Um, she's an astrologer, and she's a little, like, new age wooey for me with some stuff. She's, like, channels, like, plebeian entities, and I don't know. Like, I, 
I have my own issues with all that stuff, but like I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater kind of thing. And you know, she seems like a nice enough person. I don't like I don't judge people for that kind of stuff, but it's just sort of like sometimes my eyes glaze over when people get too into that thing and I just kind of zone out on it. But either way, if you want to check out a book, uh, I'll send you a, a a link or a that that book if you want to read more on it cuz you seem like you're pretty interested in it. Um yeah. So anyways, Again, this rainbow bridge idea. And the rainbow is all spectrums of light, so it's kind of like everything encompassed into the visible realm. That's, I think, part of it. Um, but anyways, so in astrology, it's kind of that. It's sort of like it might be this wound that you've received, like, you know, the wound of Christ, the eternal wound that doesn't heal. But the reason you have that wound is to be able to use the knowledge or the mystical. I, I hate using these like terms, mystical, spiritual, like whatever. It's kind of like overdone, but that's the best way I can express it. The, the spiritual learnings that you've gotten from that wound to help other people. And so that's kind of the theory behind it. Now, Chiron is similar to the nodes where it moves pretty slowly. So there's going to be a butt ton of people with Chiron and Gemini within a year or two of your birth. So that's why, again, the house is important because the houses are unique to the person. Because when you're born, let's say you were born uh, 30 minutes. Um, let's see. Hold on one second. Things are going to travel up. Yeah, say you were born like 30 minutes earlier. Your Chiron would have been in the 12th house. Uh, it, it, it would have been in a completely different house. So that's why it's unique to you. But Chiron and Gemini is still going to be in Gemini for everybody born on the day you're born and, you know, months before or after or years even, depending. Mm -hmm. So the 11th house... It's kind of a weird house. There's, there's a lot of themes that fit into it, but usually it's about social groups. It's about uh, themes of Aquarius, sort of, like implementing your self-identity into a social construct, a social group. And, and sometimes this is a dangerous thing. You might look at a group and it might seem unique and cool. And so you feel like, well, this group, everybody dyes their hair and wears punk rock clothing so that seems unique and rebellious and going against society, but it's still like a social group in itself. So you might try to find your self-identity through that and the, 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 the attractiveness of it is that you feel unique, but really, and you're just being a hypocrite. Not, I don't want you to be mean about it, but you're just, you're, you're, you're realizing that you're not realizing that you're actually conforming to something and it's this packaged rebellion kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas, to me, a more proper mode of that is you actually are an individual person. And when you implement yourself in one of these social groups, you don't let um, kind of collective ideologies of that group change who you are. So even if there's something you might disagree with in that group, you'll stand firm on it, but you're still associating yourself with that group. This is a perfect example for this is like me and my relationship to like the truther world, if you want to call it that. Like I'm involved in it. I'm in it. I'm a part of it, but I don't like a lot of what goes on in it. I don't agree with a lot of things people say that it's just like, oh, the elite worship Saturn. That's just what they do. Truth or fact 101. I don't agree with that at all, but I'm still part of that group. And so that to me is like, okay, you're implementing yourself in an Aquarian mindset, a larger group that's, that's got a more collective conscious, a more uh, higher goal rather than like a group I go play, uh, you know, like I'm an old person. I go play bridge with people like that's a different kind of group. That's not like an Aquarian group. That's a more local group. <clears throat> Aquarian is like there's a there's a social movement attached to it, something like that. So the truther movement, that's like a social movement, right? So the, the Chiron in this house could indicate there's some sort of wound with that. I don't know what that would be, but in Gemini, Gemini is sort of communications, logical 
thinking your your basic uh, it's kind of like RAM memory, I think, of a, a computer. Your ability to compute things in a general menial day to day task. So if you have a lot of RAM memory, you'll be able to multitask a lot, and you'll do a lot of things more subconsciously, but you'll just be able to do them. Um, you might have short RAM, not much RAM memory. Maybe you can't do a lot of tasks, but maybe you have a big hard drive. You have a good memory for long-term stuff. So this is kind of how I relate some of these themes where Gemini is ruled by Mercury, where I think Gemini, if there's a strong Gemini, you might have a lot of RAM. You might be able to multitask a lot, but maybe you can't retain a lot of that information in the long term. Whereas Virgo is the other sign ruled by Gemini. I think Virgo is more akin to having a very good memory um, and remembering a lot of details and being able to bring them out again later on in the future. And I, I can attest to this because I have a certain amount of Virgo influence. And so um, I guess that the wound would be whatever it would make sense to you is like m maybe there was a certain social group that you attached yourself to and then it was actually very destructive for you in the end and you realize that, oh God, like, I thought I was being rebellious, but I was just a fucking sheeple like everyone else. But if you have the balls and the lack of ego to admit that, maybe that wound might help you with other people who are kind of falling into that trap. That could be an example of that. Now, whether that manifests in your life or not, I don't know. But that's just how you would deal with those themes. Okay. Okay. Wow, that actually makes a lot of sense. I, I sort of feel that way now with the occult community, or not necessarily the uh, occult community, but sort of the same community that I think you were describing, you know, this whole conspiracy, occult, truther, you know. Just yeah, like, there, there's a compartment of it. There's the yeah. there's a truther world where people might look at, like, Sandy Hook and analyze, like, okay, this is the reports and that they don't match up with reality, but they don't talk at all about like hidden forces or like astrology or any shit like that. Yeah. That's like the occult part of the truth or community. And that's really what I am really in. And then what you're in too, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of a compartmentalization of this. Oh, it's a broad theme within a broad theme kind of thing. Right. Or it could be, this is the way I look at it. And I, you know, I'm, I've been looking at this shit for not too long compared to some other people. Cause like I said, the Boston bombing, that was when I first, that was my first like wake up call because I ran into somebody who was just a, a good friend of mine now. But when I first ran into him, he was going off on the new world order. And I was like, Oh, I never heard of this shit before. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and so, but I, I'm kind of like obsessive. I've dug into a lot of different things. And um, what happens to me is like you said, there's these collective mentalities that once I've learned a certain information about something, I know that there's a lot of ignorance and just I don't mean it in a mean way or even a lack of intelligence way. You just you just haven't looked at it. You know what I mean? That that kind of happens. And I think a lot of that is by design. And I think one of the best ways to really tell to make a good assessment about these things is when things are being things are kind of promoted in both the mainstream narrative and the truther world. So for example, you can watch ancient aliens on the fucking history channel. Like there's a lot of people who think you're woo woo talking about aliens, but it's still out there in like mainstream stuff. And also there's a lot of alien stuff in, you know, the truther world. That's kind of like really where a lot, everybody kind of like, that's where everyone kind of starts. You know what I mean? You're you, once you're in that world, you're like, Oh, aliens. Oh, you know, like, you know, like one of those things that you just naturally come across first because there's so many stations and places that talk about it. And so to me, there's like this weird initiatory process into all this stuff where some people will get stuck in that world and, and, and not look at like possibilities that, you know what, maybe aliens is just a fucking psyop in the way that it's a uh, physical, you know, little gray aliens or something like that. Now, I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but I definitely lean towards that and i have good reasons why now i'm not going to tell anybody i'm right but at least i will look at that perspective whereas some people are just like so convinced that there's no other w reason there's no other way aliens fucking exist it's just a truth you know and and so to me that's kind of themes associated with this where it sounds like you're going through a process where you're starting to see that you know what there's other explanations for things that i'm hearing people talk about but you get put in a position where, okay, 
you have to be very careful. Like this is why I don't I don't ever go the fucking show route with people or they're oh they're a government agent because they're spewing off something that's been debunked. I I don't do that at all anymore. In fact, this is like a rule of thumb for me. If I don't know the person in person or I haven't had a conversation with them or a dealing with them like you know email correspondence, I haven't talked with them on Skype, I haven't had some sort of absolutely personal experience with them, I'm never going to tell anybody that they're you know, I'm never going to accuse them of anything like that because I think that's just bad karma. But I can have my suspicions, but I just feel like I don't want to do that. I don't want to go there because I don't know. There's human lives are so complex. There could be so many things going on with that person that maybe they just really want something to be that way and they're blinded. Like I see that in people in real life that I know aren't CIA agents, just regular shit in their own life. Yeah. So that could be easily applied to a more macrocosmic level. So that's kind of how I look at it. I don't know how I'm rambling on here, but I don't know how you feel about that kind of stuff. I would say I agree uh, going back to the points about shit. Now I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> sorry. What were we talking about before you just, just you're seeing stuff in the truth or world that you're like, well, I don't know if I agree with that. It's kind of yeah. suspicious now. Yeah, like you mentioned, you start off at like the alien level. And that's, that is the, man, I was just on the phone with somebody earlier talking about that. And that is to me like the entry level into the truth or community, conspiracy theory, however you want to label it, like aliens. That's that like the Alex Jones level. Yeah, right? I was just saying, and then the Alex Jones FEMA camps, you're all gonna die. <laughs> right there, yeah. It's that's like it's aliens, and then it's a little bit of that New World Order fear mongering, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of graduate to that next level, or you move on. To or that you next stay level. stuck in it, you know. Or you stay stuck in it, absolutely. But then when you do graduate, then I think that's where you stumble onto things like astrology and magic, the more spiritual component to the truth or community. And I think that's where I'm at right now. But then I find myself, and I haven't even really got into it that much, just maybe the last couple of years, just reading and researching and talking to guys like you about it. But I'm, I'm starting to have those same sort of doubts again. Like, well, maybe there is another explanation here. And, and trying to find, trying to, to regain, I think, that balance that we talked about in the beginning. I don't know. I don't know if we were recording at that point, but we were talking about finding that balance between right and left brain, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I'm at now is to bring this conversation probably full circle back into harmony is trying to find that balance between that dark conspiratorial occult side and the spiritual component to that as well with with this material reality that we're all sharing which you know does suck a lot on some level and and <laughs> i think i think we're pining for something over on that other side that that we want most of that stuff to be true because what we have right here is very just bland and boring and i think that stuff makes life a little bit more exciting you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it's a strange world and i'm kind of at the point where i i've i've looked at everything that I know of in, in the whole conspiracy world, whatever you want to call it. And I have formulated my own general opinions about each topic. And what I mean by that is like certain things I just kind of go by percentages on like something like the flat earth, man, I'm like 60, 40 with that kind of stuff. It just depends on certain days. I'm like, dude, like, I think it's fucking flat and they're fucking with us. Or like, you know what? This is a psyop. Like, I, I, I kind of have this duality in my head about it, but, uh, or, or it's like, or it doesn't even really matter because it's something different altogether. And I, I kind of lean more towards that, but I, I, I kind of work out these percentages about something. Like, I don't know for sure about so many things. And I, I'm very wary about making a definitive statement about stuff, but I do lean towards certain perspectives and that certain perspectives make more sense to me, but I'm, I know that I still could be wrong, but there, there's certain topics or certain things that my eyes will still like, now that I know about them, it's really hard for me to not be a dick in my mind about it to other people, because I just know there's so much bullshit attached that they don't actually know about. And I have a heart. I, I try not to project that onto them 
because they just haven't looked at it versus like I'm seeing the influence of stuff. That's my problem with all the occult stuff here is that I'm late to it in life, or at least I feel like I am. I still don't know as much as my contemporaries do, like just in the podcasting uh, I, space. I feel like there's, you know, there's a reason for that, though. You know, I think being later to something sometimes is better depending on your situation because you might not be so gullible or susceptible to bullshit because you're a little bit more battle tested in that in your everyday life. So even though you might sort of like get sucked into it a little bit, you're going to be able to not be sucked in super deep. Yeah. You'll be a little sucked in and be like, okay, wait a second. Something's not right. I can step back. Whereas somebody younger might be like, next thing you know, they're like walking around in a cult wife swapping. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> yeah. you know, like, like that's yeah. the way I look at a lot of this stuff. It's very, it's very intrinsic to our reality, but at the same time, there's a lot of fucking illusion and bullshit. And that's another thing about Neptune. That Neptune is a planet of illusions and stuff like that. And so to me, Neptune is like the new ager planet where it's all about oneness and everything's connected, man. And yeah. Pluto is more about like the occult, like deep, dark fucking depths of shit. And I feel like I have interesting aspects that are both of them and they're both fucking tense. So I've had to deal with a lot of shit sorting through those things and trying to combine them into like something that makes sense to me. And so mm -hmm. like you were saying, like just arriving onto the scene later, sometimes that can be more of a blessing. Yeah, because I, I can tell that people like so I host a podcast. I called it O-Culture more to just explore what I find fascinating in this space, not necessarily tied to the occult as a as a subject matter. It's more of just a, a catch-all term for me. But mm -hmm. everybody asks me, oh, well, do you practice magic? Do you do astrology? And, like, do you, like, am I actually, like, doing what you're doing? Like, do I have fucking astrology software? No. Do I have a ritual circle somewhere in my house? No. <laughs> no. Like, and I and I think I'm, I think that's what, that's what you're getting at is I don't feel the need to just go balls deep into that stuff. You don't need to go get a fucking curly uniform <laughs> right like i'm cool like just reading about it and talking about it because i do think there's some value to knowing this stuff to seeing how it can apply to my life and to how it could possibly make it better but do i want to sit here and, and do magical incantations you want to every... be drawing hexagrams and pentagrams yeah, i mean not <laughs> do i want to commune with spirits every weekend no i actually just want to kind of enjoy my life as it is you know yeah, I, mean? I think and, that's and... a very smart way of approaching it. And I, I, I've i always been um, just a general intuitive sense about all that stuff. You know, I, I'm not knocking people who do those things and implement them. But like, I, I, I think that's the wrong path. Like, I'm just I'm I'm very intuitively like there's something not right about that stuff to me. And I've actually I, I bought a book. It's it's a Crowley book, but it's by Lon Milo Duquette. It's him like explaining oh, yeah. all of the rituals and stuff. Yeah, that that just came out earlier this year, didn't it? Oh no, uh, he maybe he came out with one, but this is okay. one that's like from a while. It basically, hold on one second, I'll just show it to you. So, like you were talking about, once you are in this world and you start to come across the occult stuff, you're like, oh, there's things called magic and and ritual, and then the person that really like, see, I I just started with the occult stuff immediately because that's what I was just. I at first naturally like Mark Passio. I watched a lot of his stuff. Oh yeah, he's and while, he's pretty good too. Yeah, well, there's a special like place I mean, in my he, heart. I mean, he's for, like, like pretty knowledgeable, is, is what I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I I like him. He's a passionate guy, but man, he's just like I don't I don't agree with any of his views on like police officers, and they're all like you know, they're they're all anybody who's a police officer is, is like a brainwashed retard, according to him. Like that's right. the kind of vibe I get. He's like so angry at authority. I'm just like, yeah, okay, you know, I have my own understanding about law enforcement, and I think that a lot of people project and get a lot of shit from law enforcement that they don't really realize subconsciously that they're actually, like, they're approaching it being a dick to begin with, and it's like, well, you're going to get what you put out kind of thing. And that, that doesn't doesn't happen, like, that's not saying that's every situation, but that's kind of my vibe with him. But he, I listened to a lot of what he said about Crowley. I've listened to the arguments that, you know, counter the, the stereotypical Christian, like, he sacrificed babies and blah, 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 black magic and, you know, all that crap. So I'm like, okay, let me get the most objective view from him. And I feel like Passio does a pretty good job of telling you 
these are Crowley's philosophies. This is what he meant, or as far as I understand it. So I feel like I was able to get a good perspective from that. Now, from that, I can determine whether I think it I align with that or not, or what parts that I do. So during that time, I bought this book. And in it, I'm just like reading it. I, like I'm just like, oh, magic. That sounds interesting. I have no fucking clue like w- what that is. And I'm just reading through like what you do. And I'm just like, man, this shit's too weird for me. <laughs> I'm not, I'm like, no, I'm not that kind of person. Like it's just yeah. too out there. And I just don't see the practical, like I, I almost feel like what if you're wrong and you're just some idiot in a room doing weird shit and like, you, you you think it's worth, you know what I mean? Like, what if it's really all psychological and that none of that's necessary? Yeah. Or on a, a more negative side, what if you're actually getting in touch with things that you think are good and are actually not? And I base that on a real world assessment where it's like, I see a lot of wolves in the world that are very good at disc- disguising themselves in sheep's clothing. Yeah. And I've, I've had personal experiences that have nothing to do with like a cult shit and so you don't really know what you're getting into unless you have a confrontation with something and so what i wonder is if i'm getting in touch with entities and shit and they all seem nice and they tell me these nice things or is there an angle and when i'm not in line with those things does that turn into hell and i think it's safer just to not fuck with it at all because it's a whole realm that i don't really know let's just be honest we don't know what the fuck is going on with all that stuff some people claim they do I think that's fool's gold. I, so I, I that's my anybody, viewpoint on it. I think anybody who claims to know anything in this space is probably a fucking charlatan. <laughs> I, I mean, that that's just my impression. Like, you can't sit there and say that you know the truth about anything. I think the truth is it's all just a matter of perception, right? What's true to you is not true to me. You said something earlier about communing with the entities or trying to get... What if that was the trick all along was to take people that you know, probably would be the most talented magicians, for example, and sort of just, you try to get them with religion when they're young, right? And a lot of people fall into that trap. And the people who get disenchanted by that usually turn to something like the occult because they they want that spiritual, you know, sort of foundation in their lives. Exactly what what I think. And if, (laughs) if the elite believe in the occult, and then you have all these people that are turning to it. Well, you're kind of just guiding them into the space where you're still controlling everything. Yeah. And now, and now you're getting them to to sort of do your do your bidding for them on the on the spiritual level. Just sort of like uh, engaging all that energy that that's you know sort of hidden there in the ether or whatever. It just seems like the occult so is the dangerous. The one world religion. Right, which which I believe would be probably theosophy if we had to put our, our money on anything. Right? That is exactly what I think. And I don't try to be judgmental about people I think are falling into that because I think that that's part of it. Like some people need to be in that to realize it or, you know, whatever. Everyone's path is different. I don't know. I'm, I don't want to fuck with people's shit, but I will give an opinion on it, but I'll also be sympathetic, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, But, you know, again, that's my assessment of it. It doesn't mean that I'm right. So my whole thing is with this occult stuff, it obviously runs our world. So to me, there's parts of it that are tools and not inherently corrupt. But I think with this stuff, this occult literature, the stuff that I read from in all my series, you're getting a version of that. It's no different than growing up and I go to Sunday school and I'm a Catholic altar boy. You're getting a version of spirituality there. Yeah. And like you said, I think that the occult is a way to weed people out who are smart enough to see through the first veil. Right. But (laughs) you're told that this veil of ISIS that you've seen through is the be all end all. And I think that there's something beyond that. And this is why I do think there's actually certain things in Orthodox religion that I ascribe to because the occult intentionally makes them look really terrible and stupid. But I think that the people who fall into Orthodox religion, there's still some intuitive weird connection to this idea. Like to me, this idea of like a creator God or a a personal God in the sense that it is invested in your life personally. Now people think, Oh, well that's a personal relationship with Jesus. And I just talk to him every day about what to do. And Jesus tells me what to do to me. That's kind of like, you know, whatever, but like, 
I, I've seen things in my life that are just so personal to me that if that happened to somebody else, it wouldn't have bothered them or it wouldn't have affected them. Or they, they, you know, I've seen like instant karma for me where when somebody else does that, they get away with it forever. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Right. There's something weird about it that's tailored to me personally. I can't ignore that. And I think that that is what a lot of this occult stuff does. It, it either hides that and says, well, everything is impersonal and everything is consciousness. So you're just manifesting it yourself. And I do believe that we do manifest a certain amount of our lives by our actions. But I also do think there's a, a, a part of it that comes to us that we can't control that's controlled by something else, but it's based on our actions. So we're given different situations. And I think that really this is one big test, but I don't look at it in the way of like the Christian mindset where it's like, you believe in Jesus or you don't, you're fucked or you're not. Like, like to me, that's just... Right. That's like this fear porn part of it. But I do think there is some sort of like judgment test, but I don't think it's something that we should like fear. It's just, it's part of the system that we're in. And maybe some people should fear it more than others, depending on how they live their lives. But I feel like most people generally want to do the right thing. The problem is we keep getting deceived into things that fall back to the controllers and what they want. And that's kind of like this esoteric religion where there's so many things that I see that trap people to funnel them back into it. But that's happening to me right now somehow. I know it is. It has to be because we're imperfect. So I just try to be aware of the ways I think that's happening and do my best to avoid them and try to help other people to do the same within what works for them, where I can give opinions, I can say my perspective, but I won't tell them that that's the way to look at it. But maybe if they consider it, a light bulb will go off in their head because everybody else has to have the spark in their head for something. Like this is the way I feel like you can't wake somebody up to 9-11 by just going telling them that they're a sheeple and, you know, whatever. They have to have the thought that, you know what, maybe there is something wrong with this. And you don't help that when you're screaming in their face about it. You can give them your opinion and tell them why. And you can even argue and get passionate about it. But don't take it to that level where you call them a moron because that's immediately going to turn them off. Mm -hmm. Maybe somewhere down the road they're going to have that thought, you know what, maybe Mike was right about that. Maybe I should look into that. But they have to do that themselves. And to me, that's the whole idea of your self-initiation. You have to pursue that. And that's why I think in Freemasonry it's so important that they say, you have to come here of your own free will. You know what I mean? I think there's something very strange about your own free will. And I think there's a lot of traps that try to get you to – you know, oh, my free will is telling me I want to commune with spirits and not to get too long winded about this. But actually, I'll let you talk. But then I'll, I'll give you my own experience about some of these like contacting spirit things that have happened to me. Well, my only comment in there was what if, I just had a thought. What if the occult, you know, which which means hidden, right? Yeah, but the, the, the religious aspect there's to me, the occult, there's like it's like if you look up a word in a dictionary, there's like five different uses. Sure. Yeah. To me, there's like the philosophical religious part. Then there's the word just hidden and whatever. So are you talking right, about right. the religious sense? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. I think, no, I think I'm, well, yeah. Okay. I'm talking about in the sense that the word or the, the theme of the occult is popularly used. So whatever sense that is, probably the religious slash spiritual sense. But what if, what if just, it's ironic that that is the system that's actually hiding the system beyond that you were talking about okay so here's religion veil of isis lifted oh here's this entire new you know spiritual realm that you've been unaware of your entire life here it is enjoy it and but, but then there's that's the actual veil that's what's hiding whatever is beyond that and that's what's hard to that? explain to people yeah you did a good but, job but I don't know what that is. I don't know what's beyond that. But it could be like that itself is the veil. And then getting beyond that, man, I don't it's, know how you it's do it. It's the demiurge within the demiurge. That's the way I look at it. It's a Chris like, Nolan. It's a Chris Nolan film. We're living in a Chris Nolan film. You know, <laughs> the the dream within a dream, the Inception thing. That's interesting. The demiurge within the demiurge. Yeah, because like you know, that's the other thing. I hear so many people that are in the, the truth through world and like somebody like John Lash and I'll just give my opinion on him. I just get bad vibes from that guy. I don't mean him any harm. And, and you know, he's got some things that he'll say I agree with, but I just don't like his general demeanor. But again, it's one of those things where I can agree with like certain concepts of people, but a lot of the times it's the way they implement them 
or how they carry themselves about it. It's just like, just because I agree with the concept of it, I might not like the way they conduct themselves within, you know, how they treat people. Like to me, like how you treat people is, is really everything. I, I respect that a lot more than anybody's status. That's just how I've always been. You know, I don't give a fuck if you're a LeBron James and, you know, back when I cared about basketball. Like, <laughs> if you're a fucking dick, like, I don't like I had to like separate my Michael Jordan fantasy like oh greatest basketball player ever when I was young to be like you know what Michael Jordan's kind of a fucking asshole <laughs> like that was like one of my like when I was a kid separating from that like my learning experience but w with him like my the thing I find very ironic is a lot of the stuff he promotes like you know he he's outspoken about mass immigration the whole you know, like you know Germany nationalism was good whatever but the fucking UN is following the exact same doctrines about Gnosticism that he's telling everyone is like the truth, right. you know, like, Oh, Sophia and Lucifer are good and blah, 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 blah. And every philosophical concept that he's promoting is in line with the elites religion who are manipulating all these NWO organizations, the UN, whatever that he's angry about. So I don't know if like, I, I think it's just, ignorance about it but again i sense a massive ego and i think that that's probably what's blinding him to that stuff now it's just a, I don't know the guy but that's just my general assessment of it yeah and so you get into these weird situations where i'll agree with people on stuff but i fucking can't stand them it, it's like how i look like i like certain bands like 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 tool obviously you had the whole conversation with nathan lee about it but like I, I can't stand tool fans sometimes they drive me crazy <laughs> like they're just so I'm... like I, I'm in I, I like totally this transcendental yeah. world of like, like Maynard just like took me to a Kater or something. You know, I'm just like, yeah, I, I'm just like, I don't idolize musicians. And like, I, yeah, the music is cool and it's awesome. And if that's inspiring to you, that's great. But like, it, it's almost like some people use it whenever people use it as like this, like I'm more enlightened than you motif to it. That's when I get pissed about it. That's when I'm like, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I love Tool. They have a lot of great lyrics, a lot of insightful occult stuff going on. Very great. But if you're going to tell me that, like, you're somehow more enlightened because you listen to Tool and, like, other people are just, like, fucking peons of consciousness because they don't know what you know that you've gotten through Tool, like, dude, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Like, you're oh, just an man. asshole. Yeah, no, you know? I, I, I totally agree. Now that that was um part of my introduction to this theme in my life was through music. So uh, and, and, and yeah, me too. Tool, tool, and tool was, part, was of part of it. Tool was part of that. I I learned who John D was from listening to their music and looking at their artwork. <laughs> but I would agree with you, man. Like I I can't stand the people that are like that. I was guilty of that a couple of years ago. You know, like when I first sort of I hate the term woke up, but when I first sort of it was uh, Sandy Hook, right? I mean, that that's what did it for me. Like just watching the media coverage of that throughout the day and how the how the story changed, and you know, you had that that father of that girl was laughing when he took the podium, and like just those Bobby Parker, happiest Bobby Parker, guy in right? The world. Yeah, yeah, like just just those things. I was like, man, this is fucked up. And then of course you start researching it on Reddit or 4chan or wherever after that, and you're like, well, shit, this is there's isn't, two is... smoking guns to Sandy Hook, in my opinion. One is Gene Rosen giving a false story on camera and the cameraman correcting him. Okay, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And then the guy who plays the the the, the, the two people who addressed the White House with Obama who had victim kids, David Wheeler is a fucking actor, and you can see him in an FBI type uniform, but no FBI patch. And he's carrying a fucking rifle by like the magazine, like like all. There's a guy. Barry Satoro points it out. All the soldiers are like they have their guns to the ground. They're marching. This guy's just like waddling around with this machine gun by the magazine. <laughs> he's got no FBI patch, and it's fucking David Wheeler. You look at him. He's got the mole, at, and it's just like, what the fuck is going on with that? That one is like so bad. That if anybody who was in the military or police force was honest with themselves and they looked at that, they'd be like, that guy is an imposter. And it was all over mainstream TV. He's just walking through. Anyway, sorry, I had to say that. Those are the, no, those are the okay. only two things you need to show somebody to Sandy Hook and be like, something's very wrong with this. Well, I mean, you could show them a lot of things. I think the Robbie Parker thing would probably be more 
would speak to more people at a like an emotional level. Yeah, you know? yeah. The other things are yeah. just like more factual, like yeah. reality situations where people can make excuses all day. Oh, people grieve differently. Oh, he might have been on all these antidepressants. You know what I mean? Like, which is bullshit, obviously. But right. there, there is see, that's combining it. You got to combine the intuitive, emotional thing where these emotions are not what happens. Mm-hmm. You know, when when children die. Plus, all of these material things don't add up. And that's why I like the, the people that can connect both of them. And I have a, you know, you, you probably watch We Need to Talk About Sandy Hook. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the guy who was like in charge of most of that, Peter Klein, I've actually spoken on the phone with him a few times. He, he's really cool. And he actually promoted my channel. And it's funny because he's one of these like, really matter if he's one of those dudes who's going to like search through reports. He's very like left brain minded with all this stuff, but he's also very open to a lot of the occult stuff. He's just kind of like, well, that stuff scares me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, Oh, it's too, you know what I mean? But like, he knows there's something to that. And yeah, he's actually really cool to talk to. And he's somebody that like, it's cool talking to certain people in person. Cause I'm like, well, this, this is just, he's just a fucking legitimate dude. It's nice to actually get that personal connection with some of those people. Cause I'm like, all right, I know for sure they're not a shill. <laughs> that one I can say and back them up for certainty because I've actually yeah. talked to them. You know? Yeah, yeah. I don't think uh, a government-funded shill would take the time to talk to you on the phone a couple of times about Sandy Hook. I mean, that's that's my impression of it. But and you can just tell by the way he talked. Like he's just an average dude. He was talking about, you know, like yeah, man, looking to get out and start dating again, but like. <laughs> You know, it's tough yeah. because, like, when do I tell them about this stuff? You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, so girls don't just come up to you and be like, oh, my God, you're the, we need to talk about Sandy Hook guy. You're hot. <laughs> that doesn't happen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you got to be able to joke about this shit. That's, that's, that's where I like it, the point that I'm at now where it's like I don't get too serious about it all. Like, I do laugh. Like, I'll, I'll hang out with my girlfriend and look up and be like, oh, man. That chemtrail, I give it a fucking 7 out of 10. Like, they didn't even cross very well. There's no, you know what I mean? Like, I'll like, like, rating chemtrails. It's like, oh, that guy got a perfect tic tac toe pattern. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, I'm joking about that shit. You know, you got to. I'm not there yet with certain topics. Like, the chemtrails just fucking, they still make me probably angrier than they should. But. (laughs) Yeah, there's just things that I just I can't joke about yet because it's it still it still strikes a nerve for some reason. Yeah, well, it uh, strikes a nerve in me, but like I'm at the point where at least I can express it in a way that I can be humorous about it and go on with my day and not be dragged down by it. Because right at the end of the day, the hardest thing is you realize that I got no fucking control over this. I can go out there and put myself on a megaphone and say everything I know about the new world order. It's not going to make a goddamn difference in the really grand scheme of all of this, but there's still a personal purpose to my involvement in it, and you just got to figure out what that is and be comfortable with it and not worry so much. You know what I mean? Like, don't – I just – for me personally, I'm not going to be this hero out there battling the New World Order in some, like, Hollywood way. It's like – it's in the trenches, everyday life, dealing with people in a personal way, trying to give them insight that you think is helpful, trying to gauge where somebody's at. Like if somebody tells me a political candidate is the solution and they're all involved in that, I know that I can't talk with them about certain things. I don't <laughs> I don't look at them lesser or anything like that. I just know that they're under a certain mind frame that, you know, like, oh, the Democratic Party can do no wrong. You know, it, I don't have a problem with people getting invested in politics, but to, to what extent, you know? Or... Yeah, I've had similar experience just within my, my own family. And, and like we had a conversation uh, over Labor Day weekend, a big group of us, and we all came to the conclusion that birds of the same. Well, what was the phrase I used? So, you know how we have this sort of like Phoenix symbolism and then we also have like this left right paradigm. Well, I've always seen left as the left wing, right as the right wing of this bird. But we don't oh, yeah. realize that that the wings are attached to just the same fucking body, and they're both flapping together to to work together, right? So that's, that's how the I describe best way it. to describe it. <laughs> well, I think you know? it is, but well, two birds, it's... one flight path. Yeah, or yeah. Two, two so... wings, one flight path. Sorry. So we all came to that conclusion, and then just imagine this: 
We're all talking. We all come to this consensus. Yes, this is the way things are. Awkward, not awkward pause, but just a pause, you know, five, seven seconds. Oh my God, did you see what Trump said the other day? That That's the kind of shit is like, we can see it on some level. We can come to an agreement, but then we, we get sucked back into the uh, theater of it all because it's just so interesting, right? And that's sort of my issue with a lot of astrology. It's like some people that are really good astrologers or they know a lot of stuff, they're very well versed in it. They'll talk about a lot of events or cycles like it's just astrological influence, like like it's just uh, the nature of cycles where it's like I'm of the mindset that there are certain energies and if there is really a group that is in control of all the media that can just start throwing stuff out there and they know the mass consciousness will just run with it. Like a lot of these things, like, oh, people, like, it's it's almost like people think a lot of things are organic, where I think that, you know, some things must be, but like, oh, you know, we had Uranus move into Aries and all of a sudden the Libya happened because this is like, I'm just like, it happened probably because they knew that alignment was happening and that was a time where they could utilize that to pull out an agenda. And that yeah. is my biggest problem with a lot of the astrologers is like, they don't, Maybe they do make that connection, but they don't say it. But, like, it's never really talked about. And that's what I like, at least in the occult science series, where I can go through some of these alignments and be like, hey, look at the Vatican's doing when Neptune is in Pisces. You know, they're doing all these themes that have to do with that. To me, they know something about astrology. It's not just the, the Vatican doing it organic. And Pope Francis isn't doing this just because the astrological gods just made it happen. They're fucking doing it on purpose. <laughs> That's my view viewpoint on a lot of these things. And when people start like analyzing it so in depth, I, it's not that they're not analyzing something that isn't real, but I just feel like there's this component on that upper level that they're just completely missing, even though they are aware of those things. Like you just said, like they'll know, oh, politics is bullshit, but then Trump, you know what I mean? Like my, yeah. my, you know, and that's kind of my issue with a lot of astrology is that I just want to separate myself from that where I don't want to make like predictions or be like, oh, you know, this is going to happen in the next six months in the, the America. Shit's going to go. I mean, shit's always going crazy. Like, I don't know. It's, it's so generalized. It's like, I'd rather spend my time on astrology with people on a personal level because it's going to have so much more profound impact on their life rather than being like, Oh, I'm saying all these things that may or may not happen. And when something does happen, it's like, whoop de doo you sort of predicted an event. Like, what does that even do? It doesn't really, it doesn't have any real world application to me. That's just my opinion. Though. I, I get tired and bored with astrologers who talk about the economy and politics as if that's what we all should be most concerned with in our own lives. My local government makes, does more things that affect me than my federal government does. And that's what I think we need to be focusing on it is let's bring our fucking attention and our energy back to our present moment, our present location. And let's worry about that and not worry about not stop sending all of that fucking energy to wherever that you have no control over. And I think I think we're on the same page here when it comes to that. But I have to get going soon, man. I do appreciate your time, though. I uh, appreciate you hanging out for as long as you did. Enjoy the rest of your evening, dude. All right, you too. Good All right, time. Man. All right, later, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Michael Joseph for the NATO chart reading and the great conversation. And I should also thank Nathan Lee, a.k.a. Occult Fan, for connecting me with Mike in the first place. And as I mentioned uh, in the intro to this, this particular conversation really captured me specifically in a self-reflective mood. I shared some of my doubts about what I've come to learn about the occult, both as a belief system and as a spiritual practice. I am pretty hesitant to delve, uh, as I said, balls deep into a routine magical practice. I think mostly because I, I don't have the necessary spiritual discernment yet. But also because it, it does kind of scare me a bit. I, I feel like I'm fucking around with something I don't quite know if I should be fucking around with. Of course, those of you who know me personally know that's never stopped me before. And as a Scorpio, I am naturally curious, and that sort of thing does appeal to me, but I think I just need a better foundation underneath me before I attempt to commune with those spirits. Then again, I may never decide to do that, and I'm okay with that too. 
that may lessen people's opinions of me or this podcast, but again, I'm okay with that. I don't think everyone who's interested in magic has to be a practicing magician. I don't think everyone who's interested in astrology has to interpret natal charts. I don't think everyone who's interested in pro wrestling has to be a pro wrestler. Although of the three, that last one's still the one that appeals to me the most for some reason. I'm weird. But I say that with absolutely no shame. I guess I've come to look at occultism and esotericism in the same way I do any other subject that I've taken a legit interest in. I just want to learn as much as I can about it without clinging to it as a way of life or a belief system or or taking a dogmatic approach to it. Call me a neutral observer. But anyway, thanks so much for coming to my birthday party this year. It was a pleasure to share this conversation with you. I really can't express how much I do appreciate the fact that you spend an hour or two or more with me every week. Your time and attention really is the best and most thoughtful gift you could give someone. Because honestly, it's the only commodity we have that we all will eventually run out of. You can always find a way to get more money. You can always find a way to get more material bullshit. But you cannot always find a way to get more time. And if someone asked me what I've learned the past year of my life, it'd be that. That time is precious, it should not be taken for granted, and it should only be spent doing things that set your soul on fire and with people who know how to fan the flames. And with that, I'm out of here. If you want to drop me a birthday gift, check out oculturepodcast.com slash support, or drop the show a five-star review on iTunes, share it on social media, whatever you can do to help, I appreciate it so much. And until next time... You've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.